So we know that we all need to fight climate change. This is not a topic only for the environmental specialists. This is not a topic only for us in our personal lives. This is not a topic only for architects. This is really focused directly within the interior design space and not just interior designers. Any architects, anyone that touches interior specification um, is really who this, who this information today pertains to. Um, we know that, you know, with COP27, um, every year um, world leaders coming together to discuss the importance of climate change. We know that United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has indicated that there's already been irreversible damage to the planet and to the ecosystems due to global warming. We all individually have a responsibility to try to prevent the catastrophic impacts if we see that the average annual temperature increases by 1.5 degrees Celsius. Today, what we're gonna to talk to you about is what interior designers and anyone within that sphere of interior material specification um, can do to fight climate change. And we're also gonna talk about a tool to help you in that effort. Um, so as we talk about this presentation, like I mentioned to you, it's something that we've developed in conjunction with Metropolis Magazine. And we partnered with them to share this content in order to highlight the carbon impact uh, and specifically within the interior design space. So first, um, we're going to get into some doom and gloom, the problems that we face and why we all need to take action. Then we're going to look at some solutions and considerations for interior design. And then finally, Avi will join us and share a toolkit that was developed by Metropolis to support the journey and the challenges created in creating low carbon interior spaces. So we've known for almost 20 years that the construction industry puts greenhouse gases into the air. And greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide form a blanket around our, around our planet. And like a blanket, you know, that trap the heat in, just like cozy blankets that we use throughout the winter to keep us warm. You can see here how the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere has been increasing at really an alarming rate, specifically due to human activity. Pre-industrial revolution, before the industrial revolution, plants, soil, the oceans were able to absorb the natural CO2 in the atmosphere. Now where we are today and how we continue to emit more and more carbon dioxide, we see that this has just overloaded our system and the natural systems just simply cannot process it anymore. Um, so when we think of kind of where we're at from a building industry perspective, imagine that in 2040, in 2040 approximately two thirds of the global building stock that we have, <clears throat> that, excuse me, approximately two thirds of the global building stock will be buildings that exist today. So without widespread, without widespread, um, existing building decarbonization across the globe, these buildings will still be emitting CO2 emissions in 2040, and we will really not achieve Paris Agreement's um, 1.5 target. So we really need to focus, what can we do on the existing building stock? And then when we think about new construction, um, global building floor area expected to double by 2060. Um, if you can think about that as being the equivalent as in adding an entire New York City to the world every month for 40 years. Um, and then now, finally, as we think about embodied carbon, what are we focused on today? So when we look at all the new construction that is projected to take place between now and 2040, we see the critical role embodied carbon plays. And, and that's exactly where we're, we're going to tackle today. So let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at this slide here. So in 2003, Edward Masria presented these numbers for the first time, and they've been a little bit adjusted now, you know, kind of they've increased about a percent or two, but it really shows the global building, <coughs> excuse me, it shows the buildings industry, the building industry's global emissions. Um, and when you look at this here, we're responsible, we collectively being part of this industry, responsible for about 40% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions. Our industry, our industry's responsibility really hasn't changed in these 20 years. Um, and it's really not going to change going forward uh, with, as we look at the projected new construction that's happening, very rare to go into a city and not see cranes all over the place. Um, so as we look at this, we're going to pay attention to two parts of this pie. We're going to pay attention to the 27% that you see for building operations. And then we're going to pay attention to the 13% for materials and construction. And what we're really going to do to talk about embodied carbon is we're going to dive into that 13% a little bit more. And as we start thinking about this 13% that's attributed to building and construction materials, note that this does not include a thorough analysis of the interior materials impact on that 13%. It is mainly focused on core and shell. So what we want to ask ourselves is where is the interiors in this pie? 
And in order to think about that, we're going to talk about two key elements uh, focused on embodied carbon and life cycles. So now as we tackle kind of our first topic here, embodied carbon. So to understand carbon emissions of interiors and interior design, you really need to understand two key concepts. And the first one is embodied carbon. So embodied carbon, what does that equal? That equals the carbon emissions associated with making building products, with construction from raw material extraction to manufacturing, to transportation and to end of life disposal or recycling. This includes <coughs> all associated carbon dioxide emitted before the building is even built and before the interiors are even finally fit out. Um, and, and really when you think about that, the embodied emissions of a building are really kind of locked in once the building is constructed and everything that is in that building can't be taken back or reused. They're, they're really there and they're locked in. Um, and then when we think about embodied carbon also as it relates to annual global emissions, right now embodied carbon is a fourth of the building sector's emissions. So what's interesting here is that there is an actual great opportunity and it's an incredible opportunity for embodied carbon reduction directly through material specification and material selection. And that ultimately is directly through design. So here, as we take a look now, um, as we think about kind of the state of the nation, as far as renewable energies and the fact that our buildings are getting more efficient, we know that many, many um, renewable energy options are, are, um, are available now. We know that green codes are being put in place in different jurisdictions just in order for us to get close to meeting the Paris agreements of 1.5 degree, degrees Celsius. And ultimately, getting to net zero, I'm not going to say that it's easy, but thinking about getting to net zero and operational carbon is potentially achievable. Um, currently, one-fifth of energy in North America comes from renewable resources. So we are absolutely making more efficient buildings, um, and we know we're going to continue to do that. <clears throat> so as our operational carbon comes down um, be and the need to run our ener the, the energy needed to run our buildings comes down, embodied carbon becomes a bigger piece of this pie. So if we look at this here and we think about if we do nothing today, when we know that our buildings are getting more efficient, embodied carbon will ultimately be half of the building sector's emissions by 2050. So now the second part here to talk about is life cycles. Um, and we know that this, you know, this is a really critical concept to understand in order to calculate the carbon footprint of interiors. Life cycles are really kind of this lifeblood of, of interior design. So once a building is built and the structure and the envelope, we know they aren't going anywhere. That embodied carbon is locked in. It's there um, really until the building is modified, demolished, you know, in a number of decades. We, we, we want to think about we build a building. It's going to last 50, 75, 100 years. Um, but interior design has a completely different life cycle. In any kind of space, the interiors are renovated every few years. Home renovations in the U.S. were at an all-time high during the pandemic. In hospitality spaces, FF&E <clears throat> refresh every five years. Healthcare facility managers switch out surfaces every 10 years. In workplace projects, renovations where they used to happen every five years, now potentially partial refreshes are happening potentially every three years. Um, you know, this is a huge, huge impact every time you look at a turnover of materials. What's happening to the materials that are in that building right now? Where, where and how are they being disposed of? Are they being reused? What are the new materials that are coming into the buildings? So not only do you have the original embodied carbon from the original construction, but now layered on top of that is every new material that comes into the building. So, so now this is, you know, what we're going to talk about here is a case study conducted by LMN Architects in Seattle because they, they wanted to dig in here and find out just, um, just how the carbon just what the carbon emissions of their interior renovations added up to. Um, and I think that we can probably use this as a general model for most interior spaces. So in 2020, the Carbon Leadership Forum created a simple calculator to look at emissions of tenant improvement projects. I think most of you know workplace renovations undertaken by tenants. Um, so the team at LMN used that calculator to make assumptions and to look at the renovation of their own office space, which is spread out over three levels in the Norton building in Seattle. So what you see here in this diagram, whoops, let me just flip back here quickly. So what you see here and hit this diagram 
um, is the different renovations that L of in LMN's own office um, that have been taken on since 1984. So each renovation has a different scope. Um, as you can see here, each renovation has a different carbon footprint. And this is pretty typical for most office spaces. So now as we jump ahead and we take a look at that, um, you know, kind of in this chart format, and let's start on the left-hand side. So when LMN Architects laid out this data for the embodied carbon emissions for their, their TI project and compared it against the embodied carbon emissions of the structure and the envelope of that same space, what they found was that the embodied carbon of interiors can potentially add up to be more than that of the structure and envelope combined. So if we look here on the left-hand side, we see kind of the original construction. And then as we scroll through and as we take a look kind of from left to right, we see the bars here being added up to represent the embodied carbon footprint of all of those future renovations. So when we end up here on the left side, that's exactly what you see. You see the blue bar remaining as is. We see for the envelope, you've got the orange bar and you see the rust colored bar now actually from accumulation of interior finishes. And when we think about that embodied carbon, actually surpassing the core and the shell and the actual structure of the building. So now if we think about, you know, kind of adding everything up that we've talked about and discovered so far, when we think about, you know, kind of out of global emissions where we're looking at for, you know, when we project ahead to 2050, I can't even believe it's December and now we're talking about 2050. Um, we know that the building se sector accounts for about 40% of the world's carbon emissions. By 2050, embodied carbon will be about half of that. So now let's say we get to about 20%. And remember that the original figures for embodied carbon only really included and focused on core and shell, not interiors. So nonetheless, let's, ensue, uh, let's assume that 50% number. If interior design renovations are about half of the building's embodied carbon over its lifetime, then we end up getting to about 10%. So, and again, remember, we're basing this number on LMN study, which, which in theory underestimates some of those numbers because we know that their numbers were used based on current day EPDs and current day embodied carbon data information. And we know that back in the 80s and 90s, products just simply weren't created as efficiently as they are now. So we're really thinking about this as, you know, you want to see this as a huge number. Um, the interior design community is ultimately currently pretty much, and as we look towards 2050, responsible for 10% of global emissions. So as we think about this number, this is a huge opportunity to consider, change, and take action around. Um, this is a very, very big responsibility that should sim simply not be ignored. Um, and the exciting thing is there's so many of us today that are rallying around um, ways to make it possible to consistently reduce that in car embodied carbon footprint. <clears throat> so... Now that was a little bit of doom and gloom about the reality of the situation. And so now what we want to look forward to is what can designers do? What can the entire community that is responsible for specifying and installing and removing and disposing of interior materials, what can they and what can we collectively do? So number one, we can't change what we can't measure. And so assessing carbon emissions for interiors is actually possible today. It does certainly require some estimates. There isn't data available for every single product, but there certainly is a lot of data available today. And so that's why it is absolutely critical to request EPDs from all of your vendors and let the manufacturing community know what you want to know about their products and their products environmental footprint. It doesn't mean that you need to not specify a product based on the data provided, but it certainly allows you to make responsible carbon focused decisions because simply again, what you don't know, you can't change. And so if we're not able to take that data and assess it, um, then you're never going to know the potential impact that a product is going to have on your, on your space. So now if we think a little bit more here, so we've gotten into kind of assessing impact and just how critical that is. So now once you actually know the impact or once you actually have access to that data, so how do you actually make responsible design decisions? Um, and really understanding your role and your responsibility around specifications. Um, many of you may have already heard the stat that according to Think Lab, the average interior designer has 26 times the buying power of an average consumer. If any of you on this call today or anybody that's actually working in an interior design giants firm 
you have 111 times the buying power of an average consumer. So what does this mean outside of giving you like billions of dollars of power? It really means that you have huge influence through specification and of course, all the way through sampling. Um, and I want to say all the way through sampling, but really starting with design concept and when those initial samples are ordered, because we all, we all know that once you see a sample, once you put that in front of your client, it's really hard to undo what you've seen. And if you fall in love with an initial product that maybe doesn't meet the requirements for a low carbon space or even just anything in that sustainability um, forum that you're looking to achieve, um, you know, it's really hard to take back those initial product selections. So really starting a design concept all the way through to specification and buying, there is a huge responsibility um, to specify responsibility, responsibly based on the, the data that you're able to assess based on the data that you know. And so now finally, you know, we've talked about assessing and gathering that data, the responsibility that you have within your specifications. Um, and then now we're going to focus a little bit on the importance of reducing, reusing and recycling. Um, and this is certainly the hardest step to take. Uh, it definitely involves collaboration among, amongst numerous stakeholders, which is sometimes the most difficult. Um, and even though that is, this is incredibly impactful, and I think that as we dig a little bit deeper into embodied carbon, it's actually in this area here where there is actually the most impact um, possible in reducing the carbon emission of interior spaces. Um, but really for this to be able to happen, it, really broader systems need to be in place um, you know, there's, there's critical changes that have to happen in the industry, changes in policy. Uh, many manufacturers, the good thing here um, is that many manufacturers, especially in flooring and furniture, are working on this aspect. But in order for it to really um, be seen at scale, these things need to take time. And, you know, kind of back to the first point, they really require collaboration from numerous stakeholders. Really tough to do this without your GC involved really tough to do this and already kind of forward think to the end of your project um, and kind of almost build and design for deconstruction if you're not thinking about that at the very beginning of your project. So it certainly requires a new way of thinking about your projects. So now as we kind of go into this, you know, kind of as, as I'm going to hand you over to Avi and we're going to talk about this really important resource um, in order to be able to help tackle all three of these, these steps, um, there's two more things that I want to talk to you about today. What makes interior designer really unique when it comes to carbon emissions? Um, and, and the first thing here is this idea that interior design, you know, you want to see this as, as a relay race and you want to really own and appreciate and honor the idea that when you walk into a space, um, when you walk into a space, chances are that most of the projects that you're working on, that space has already been touched by someone else. Um, and so what does that look like? Because as we think about lifestyles, um, life cycles, as we think about life cycles of a space, um, this really is focusing on this idea that more likely than not, there's already been an interior designer that has touched the space that you're going in and going to work on today. Um, and years from now, after you put your incredible creative touch on a space, some other interior designer is going to come in and renovate the space that you're designing today. So what, what does this look like as we think about, you know, kind of your role as an interior designer, someone has passed a baton to you, you're passing a baton on to someone else. How will you pass that baton on and what impact will you leave on that space? Um, and what can you think about when you're designing? Do you have to go into that space and think about a complete white box, eliminating and discarding everything that's in that space? Or can you focus some of your design on, concentrating on what can be reused, what can be recycled, how can you maybe bring a little bit of that history into the space and keep it there so that there is that um, element of reuse, not only from an environmental perspective, but also just from a building footprint perspective, historically, that you can save and keep that memory alive, all of these things to be brought into your creative process. Um, so really kind of the critical question for all of you is, you know, how will you design in a way that it can be renovated responsibly? And then, you know, kind of even furthermore, what does that look like as far as including information in your spec documents um, around, you know, kind of advice or tips or, or um, opportunities for future designers to be able to leverage potential reuse programs or what have you for any of that material. And then the second part to consider when we're thinking about low carbon interior spaces um, is absolutely not to discount 
just how incredible the work that all of you do is and how interior design ultimately touches the lives of every person that walks into that space. Um, and so that's a really, that's a really big juggle to think about. Um, you know, it's a juggle to think about how you can creatively design beautiful spaces that feel amazing for everyone that's in there, but then also consider the climate, also consider our planet and lowering carbon emissions. Um, you know, I think that we can all agree that if you switch out concrete mix and buildings foundations, sure, it's going to bring the body, the buildings and carbon, uh, embodied carbon footprint down immensely. Um, but you know, kind of, as I quote Avi, as he says this, no one walking through the door would ever know. And I don't think anyone is going to feel like their life has been changed because the, because the concrete has been shifted out. But what we do know is that if you shift out furniture or flooring or paint color or lighting, um, people will notice because I think that all of you know, and there's been enough research, um, that has gone on that we know that the impact that interior design and all of those critical material selections have on people's health and health and well-being. Um, and we know that we can't sacrifice that incre incredible and important aspect of people's health and he health and well-being for a low carbon footprint. Um, so there's a lot of decisions to make and there's a lot of decisions to, <clears throat> to really start with kind of what is the carbon footprint of that particular product worth to you and worth to your design. So if we think about the example of acoustic panels that may have a very high carbon footprint, um, you know, you're not probably going to choose to design an office with no noise control. So how do you make those decisions where, you know, you know that a product is absolutely required and necessary for various aspects of your interior design space? Um, you know, so where do you maybe kind of think of back of house or another area where maybe you can select a lower embodied carbon footprint um, you know, if we think of like gypsum board or what have you, you know, how can you make those trade offs so you're not ever trading off the power that your in that your interior spaces have um, to make everyone healthy and happy? Um, so I um, I'm going to leave it here and I'm going to hand it over to Avi. Um, and I just want to encourage all of you and inspire all of you to recognize the incredible responsibility and the amazing opportunity that you have to not only change the lives of the people who experience and live and work and visit the creative spaces that you design. Um, but how can you help the world by considering the carbon impact of the materials that you select and the design decisions that you make um, that can prioritize the planet? So with that, I'm um, going to hand it over to Avi. Thank you so much, Avi. Take it away. Thanks so much, Rebecca. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, Rebecca, you've done, you did such a wonderful job setting this up here. Um, and Rebecca talked about, you know, all of these really complex decision points that we have to make now that we have this information about how much interior design is responsible for embodied carbon emissions. I don't think we can look away. I think we have to look forward. And I see some really interesting discussion shaping in the chat. So um, if you want to join in, you should be looking at chat too. There's some um, Kate, thank you so much for the input there. One of the things we've tried to do at Metropolis is to take some of those suggestions that Rebecca spoke about, you know, um, assessing impact, specifying responsibly, as well as reducing, reusing, and recycling, and start to define what are some strategies that you can use as interior design professionals in your work. Um, and so in um, 2021, we created a resource uh, called the Climate Toolkit for Interior Design. Um, and it's a great place, I think, for all of you who are listening to this conversation and want to, um, you know, uh, get involved with decarbonizing your interiors, it's a great place to start. Um, there's the, the toolkit is a section of the Metropolis website. It's available for free. And I'll talk a little bit later on about how the toolkit um, is being kept up to date as well. But let's dive in a little bit. So the toolkit is organized into three sections. Um, it, we have a section about how you can work with clients. We have a section about how you need to change your practice. So not something you know day to day on projects, but rather something you might want to discuss with your team as a whole or your firm as a whole in terms of changing how you approach design. And then, of course, we have plenty of practical advice on what you need to do on your next project. Um, and each of those sections has multiple strategies within it. 
Each strategy contains uh, suggestions for resources and tools that you can use. But before you dive into all that, there's a couple of really easy um, sections as well. You see on the image here, we have a cheat sheet, which tells you 10 strategies to look at first. Uh, we also have a get help section where we're listing all the resources that are currently available today for interior designers who are interested in lowering the carbon emissions of their work. So this toolkit is really you know, as comprehensive as we could have made it in 2021. Um, it you know, has all the information that you need to get started on this journey today. And you know, we didn't just create it out of our own brains at Metropolis. We actually involved the entire industry in creating this toolkit. So we held 12 workshops with 58 participants over a course of four months. We had a number of architecture and design firms, interior design leaders, architecture leaders, sustainability leaders from those firms giving us their input. We had the real estate and workplace teams of Facebook, Ford, and LinkedIn involved in this process, and they gave us real client perspectives. Um, we had DPR construction representing contractors, CBRE representing the real estate um, industry. We had industry associations like ASID and BIFMA. We had Carbon Leadership Forum, who Rebecca mentioned before, who has the deep academic knowledge there, as well as some of our manufacturing partners, Cosentino, Design Techs, Interface, Kielhauer, Signify, Universal Fibers, as well as some of our technology and services partners, Dell Technologies, and of course, Material Bank was a very integral part of creating this toolkit as well. We organized into working groups, just to give you a little bit of insight about how we put the toolkit together, and then we had um, so we looked at several different topics, even though the toolkit is not finally organized in this way. We looked at lots of different topics and had very deep discussions, many rounds of revisions on the toolkit. So it's a very well vetted resource. And it was important to us that the toolkit is accessible no matter what level of knowledge or where you are on your journey when you come to the toolkit. So for instance, the toolkit does have a section about learning the language of carbon. It gives you some definitions, but also helps you link out to places where you can dive a little deeper, learn a little more, educate yourself, educate your team members. Um, so we're not starting from the understanding that you already know everything because we didn't know everything when we started. It also, you know, aside from very, you know, practical day-to-day, -day, you know, information and definition, it also has some great prompts for you creatively. It has prompts for you to think about your mindset and your approach as interior designers. Um, this is one of my favorite sections in toolkit because it says we need to start thinking differently about materials. One of the things I love, one of the suggestions I love is thinking about permanence and temporariness. When we look at a material palette for a project, I don't think today we think about okay, what is the thing that's going to get you know, taken out in three years? And what is the thing that could last 10 years, but the project is going to get renovated before that, right? So like, we need to think about permanence and temporariness. So there's lots of great suggestions like that in the toolkit as well. And we'll dive into some in just a little bit. Um, so we also um, you know, have, as I said, a resources section, but the entire toolkit is a um, living resource, right? So um, by that, what we mean is it's a section of our website, which means that we can keep on updating it over time. So anytime you come to the toolkit, you're seeing the best possible information. You don't have to download a 2020 version and a 2021 version and a 2022 version, right? So it's always current. Um, and we're able to add resources as they become available into the toolkit. And one of the ways we're doing that is that actually this past year, we've taken the toolkit on the road. So we took it to three cities, Washington, DC, San Francisco, and Austin. And in each city, we held really in-depth discussions over a couple of days um, to talk about um, you know, the, the toolkit, what needs to improve, what needs to be added, how it needs to change, how it can better support the work that all of you are doing. Um, so, but even though um, as, as of today, um, you know, the toolkit uh, does contain strategies for all team members. I see a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A box. I'm gonna address them real quick. Jennifer Collins says, can the toolkit come to Seattle? Yes, we are. Seattle is one of the cities we're thinking about for 2023. So coming to somewhere close to you very soon. Um, the uh andrew uh mentioned acoustic panels the question about acoustic panels 
you, you know, acoustic panels have high embodied carbon. What is that based on? We need more data. Um, I will say that that comes from the foundational study actually that the Carbon Leadership Forum did, where they did identify acoustic paneling as one of the high carbon points um, for workplace interior. So they were looking at it, you know, based on EPD data that they have, and they have a great database. If you go to their embodied carbon in construction calculator, EC3, they do have great data on that. Acoustic panels in particular, I'm happy to deep dive into you and with, with into it, Andrew, with you if you're interested, but they are a hotspot. Um, and so we need um, we need more data definitely in the form of EPDs. Okay. Um, so let's let's dive into a few of the strategies that might be relevant to you based on what, what your role is on projects. Um, so for instance, if you're if you are a specifier, if you do materials research, if you are specifying product day, day in, day out, there's two great sections in the toolkit that you should pay specific attention to about screening products and sampling responsibly. So the screening product section has really in-depth information. And Andrew, to your point, one of the first things we say is ask for EPDs. We need more EPDs. Um, and there's you know all kinds of reasons why we don't have the number of EPDs we need. And you know we need industry change. But then um, we're also providing current you know, best practices drawn from some of the firms and the work that they're doing in terms of how they are screening products um, in their materials library. Uh, one of the things we say is you should know the carbon hotspots currently for most workplace projects. The big hotspots tend to be um, flooring, ceilings and walls, and furniture. Those are some of the first things you should be looking at. Um, but you know, we need to um, keep you know, all team members connected. So, you know, we say, do talk to internal, external stakeholders about what your criteria are for screening products. And of course, keep your young talent in the firm and spec writers involved as well, because that's really important. Um, there's, you know, definitely some information here about, you know, what metrics you should use. Um, and then, you know, we definitely recommend third-party verification or some kind of management around that information. We recommend creating a master spec list, um, which could be, you know, low tech, high tech, however you want to manage that. Um, we do provide suggestions about, you know, how to organize your materials library. Um, you know, and we've even given an example of an internal rating system that one firm uses. Uh, there's links to these resources. Of course, you don't see live links here, but if you go to the section in the toolkit, you can actually link out to documentation that supports many of these strategies. I think sampling is really important because sampling is where specification starts. If you know we start to filter products at the sampling stage, then we know that only good products make it through the pipeline of the project. Right. Uh, and so, you know, we want to make sure that we are sampling responsibly. Um, we, uh, you know, want to make sure that we, you know, are sampling only as much as we need. Um, so, you know, there's, I think, but, and then also, you know, educate clients about why, you know, we shouldn't be doing submittals with like 15 stakeholders, right? Um, you know, if we want to, if we want to make a difference, there's small and big things that we can take charge of today. Um, for project managers and project leads, um, there's specifically some um, strategies in the toolkit that you might be interested in. The first is about, you know, how do you have conversations um, with stakeholders? So, you know, when do you raise, raise the topic? Um, I think as project leaders, you have to know to read the room as far as carbon goes and know that not everybody is looking at carbon as carbon, right? So you might have a client who's interested in pursuing health goals, but as an interior design practice, you also want to look at carbon emissions. Well, there are ways to connect low carbon emission emitting products with healthy products, right? And those connect, there is information available on that. So, you know, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, a little further on when we talk about other resources that are becoming available today. But, you know, there's, I think you have to, we have to make the connection between carbon and other client goals because the carbon conversation is still new in the interior design space. And then we've suggested some questions, you know, um, to ask to kind of draw out some of that information from your client teams, um, you know, and we definitely recommend 
you know, starting, um, you know, early in the project, right? So, uh, you know, the earlier you start, the, the better it is. And then finally, you know, and then also we have to find ways to track, assess and evaluate. And I think one of the big problems we have right now is that interiors are not being um, uh, actually accounted for in life cycle analyses when you know people do that for ground up projects, um, or it's being seen as too small, you know, uh, a percentage. So we have to encourage our friends in architecture and engineering and sustainability to include interiors in that tracking, so that we can start to gather that data. Because without you know information, we're not going to be able to make progress in our industry. And of course, you know, having follow up strategies. You know, you might want to if it's too much to you know, do a carbon assessment on a, you know, a two month timeline on a project on a very quick turnaround project. Maybe you want to return to that project later to look at the bill of materials to gather as many EPDs as you can and do the calculation. The toolkit, by the way, also provides um, some guidance on actually how to do uh, some of that calculation, right? So, um, and then if you're a client facing professional, there are some great um you know uh resources for you as well how do you talk about carbon emissions as being linked to business resilience um this section of the toolkit in particular will be updated again very soon because of course the landscape of policy around carbon is changing rapidly um there are many big agencies who have implemented by team policies um you know California, for instance, um, all you know, California state purchasing and procurement now is under a buy clean policy um, that's spreading to other states. There are many states that are considering that. Um, many clients have set their own carbon goals, and therefore they just need that information to be able to connect their current interiors refresh project to their broader net zero goals. And we can help them do that, you know, through this toolkit. So, um, you know, we want to, we should be able to talk to clients. Um, by aligning the interiors work to their larger goals, knowing that they may not have considered their, you know, cyclical interior renovations and workplace refreshes as part of their work that needs to be done towards their carbon commitment. So as an industry, we have to educate our clients and help them bridge that gap as well. And, you know, there is a way that low carbon emissions projects can be a better return on real estate, right? So there are, and that happens in a couple of ways. So the first is, you know, by um, looking at, you know, more responsible material use, we might find savings in waste. Um, the cost of demos um, is going up all the time. There are, you know, tipping fees that many states are implementing. So, you know, there's, then we are coming to a place where policy is going to actually make it more um, uh, financially advantageous for us to look at low carbon interiors uh, just purely from a real estate point of view. And many of the real estate um, you know, professionals, especially leaders at CBRE and JLL and you know, some of the larger you know, real estate organizations are looking at this very closely at the moment because they know that clients are gonna start looking at scope three emissions very soon. So um, ESG reporting in general is also a big, um, uh, lever that we can use in the interiors industry, we have to help people understand that like they don't have to wait for a ground up office headquarters construction project to be able to report good sustainability tracking on their real estate. Every office refresh, every hospitality redesign, every, you know, um, healthcare um, redesign or renovation is an opportunity for that client to report um, good progress towards their sustainability goals as part of their ESG reporting to their investors and stakeholders. So that's something we need to start pointing out to them that they actually have this, you know, regular activity that they're currently not considering as part of their ESG reporting, and we can help them be part of that conversation.